Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the light of the world. Amen. We have now for three weeks returned to the story after Christmas, and we are in a particularly volatile part of Israel's history. Chapter 16 of the story begins by making an accounting of Assyria's dominance amongst the world powers. The northern kingdom of Israel is still being ruled by evil kings, and eventually even Assyria gets tired of the petulance of these evil kings and decides to just wipe them off the map. And they cart off many of the leaders of Israel into something called exile in Assyria. The next we read in chapter 16, Assyria is flexing its muscle in the southern kingdom of Judah. And they could just as easily wipe off Judah off the face of the earth. But Judah at this point is being served by one of the very few good kings of Judah, a guy named Hezekiah. And the people of Judah stand up to this blasphemous Assyrian king and God intervenes and gives Judah an unlikely victory. However, we will read in next week's lesson that Judah forestalls its demise for only a little while. Assyria's world dominance is on the way down. The next power, Babylon, is coming up, and it's not going to be pretty for Judah either. But then finally in chapter 16, we get to the meat of the chapter. Chapter 16 moves to the primary messenger of the day, a prophet named Isaiah. Isaiah is the most prolific prophet in the Bible, 66 books. And those 66 books represent a long period in Israel. In fact, probably three different periods. It represents a time before the people of Judah are forced to go into exile, the period of time in which people are in exile, and a time in which they come back from exile. And it's likely written by three different people. If you think of those three very different times in Israel's history, you might imagine then that Isaiah has different messages for people at those times, and he does. In the time before they go into exile, Isaiah is very concerned about what is going to happen to the people of Israel because of their unfaithfulness. He warns the people over and over that, that something is going to happen, and it happens. And everything is taken away from the people. And they are forced to go live in Assyria, uh, in, into uh, Assyria, Babylon, uh, apart from their ruined city and country and temple. So, and so there's a new message there. It's a message of patience, a message of hope in a God who will not abandon them. And that is the part from which our lesson is taken this morning. We'll come back to that momentarily. The third part of Isaiah is written after the people come back. And Isaiah challenges the people to the proper worship of the only true God. He talks about a God of divine deliverance and favor, a God who even in judgment will be merciful to his people. Very complicated and a very rich book. It is a book that during Advent and, and Christmas is quoted more often than any other Old Testament book. Among other reasons, Isaiah lifts up someone who has qualities that we attribute to one named Jesus. But it's not just Advent and Christmas. As the lesson from Isaiah was being read for you this morning, it couldn't help but evoke for you, if you were listening carefully, the next season after Epiphany, the season of Lent. This lesson talked about a suffering servant. The suffering servant is so important to the understanding of the whole of Isaiah's prophecies. And for the time being, let us stay in the time of Isaiah. That is, the suffering servant was not someone at that time who would go to the cross. That was not operative in Isaiah's time. In fact, it is not yet operative in Jewish faith today. 
In Isaiah's time, the suffering servant is probably not a, a person, but a nation that Isaiah is writing to this entire people who are languishing in anguish in a land of deep darkness. And if you were to relook at that lesson from Isaiah 53 this morning and substitute the nation of Israel for a person, it's pretty easy to read that nation in there. This nation would be oppressed and afflicted. By a perversion of justice, this nation would be led away. This nation would suffer, be stricken for the iniquities of its people. Nonetheless, this nation shall see hope, shall provide light and make people righteous. This nation shall take on the sins of many. If you were living in that nation, you might see words of hope in this. We, as a nation, stricken, but there will be light coming. We are the suffering servant. But things change. We live in a different day. New revelations of God evoke new understandings of God's word. And we see that by the time of the book of Acts in the Bible, these words from Isaiah 53 have taken on a radical new meaning. An Ethiopian official is riding in a chariot one day, reading the very words that we have read out of Isaiah 53 today. And he is confused. The apostle Philip goes to him and says, do you know what you're reading? He says, no, I don't. Who, who is this servant about whom the prophet writes? And we read in Acts that Philip, beginning with this scripture, tells him, all the good news of Jesus Christ. Now for Isaiah and Isaiah's time, the suffering servant may have been a nation. For us, we find something far more important. We find one who was born into the world, one who would be stricken and crushed for our sins, one who would provide light for us. And we need the light. It is true that there is so much darkness in the world. There is darkness even for people only because they are Christians who are suffering around the world for their Christian faith. We don't face that problem in America where we can gather whenever we want to call on the name of God. There is darkness for those who fear for their lives every day. Would that be in Syria? or Palestine, or even in Israel? Do people live in the darkness as they become refugees, coming even to the United States, fleeing from terrorism in their own countries, perhaps from the tyranny of a place like Syria? Beyond whole peoples, darkness often envelops individuals. This past week, I talked with two people who have been told by their doctors they may not survive their current illnesses. In one case, a Bethel member prays that the end may come to her darkness of suffering. In another, another Bethel member prays that there might be an answer to the darkness of illness so that life may go on with loved ones. Two very different circumstances, both experiencing darkness. From where will the light come? It is commonly reported that about 6.7% of Americans suffer a major depressive episode every year. 6.7%. If about 1,000 people were here at Bethel this morning, and there will be, uh, that means about 67 people coming through our doors. Major depression. And that is real darkness. Some people in our day live in the darkness of terrorism and others the darkness of being a terrorist. What perversion of the soul could lead a mind to believe that the killing of human beings could somehow be the will of God? Well, if you think you've been exempt thus far, 
all of us live under the darkness of our own hearts. Other than God, you know better the dark places of your hearts than anybody else in the world. You are the expert on your own heart, and you know its dark corners. Where are we to find light in all of this? Well, in Isaiah's time, he was trying to provide light, I believe, through a nation, that God through a nation would provide light for the world. We have come a long ways from that. We believe that God has provided light through flesh, a baby born into a major manger, one who can come to touch and be touched. How often did Jesus touch people in the Bible as he healed them? Touch is our language of compassion. Touch is a way to healing. I grew up in a family when children got to a certain age, I don't even know when that age is, uh, that we didn't touch very much, just not a touching family. I, I make no judgment about that. It was just the culture of our family. But I will tell you that when I was gravely ill as a little boy, as a larger boy, and finally even as a teenager, as I would be injured in some way, it was the touch of a mother that brought great light to my darkness. As one who thinks about the faith all of the time, I think all the time about a Jesus whose arms envelop me. That is a savior. That is a servant. My two oldest grandchildren are at a point now where we can have meaningful conversation together. They know their grandpa as one who talks about Jesus, not just at church, but at home as well. Once in a while, I will go to them and I will say something like, uh, you know, there is someone who loves you more than your mom and dad, who loves you more than your grandma and grandpa. And they'll kind of smile and shrug their shoulders and they'll say, yes, grandpa, we know Jesus loves us more. I don't even know what that means to a five and a seven-year-old. But I will tell you that I will press that message until I lack life or breath. Because if there's something I want them to have more than anything else, it's the knowledge of a Savior who will go with them every day and even provide light in their darkness. You know, that is my wish for you as well. Faith in a suffering servant who loves you even to the point of death. Now there is light. Amen. Hymn 308, please rise and sing.